I'm John Kachoyan, Literary Manager at Australian Plays, and we're talking today to Jacob Bowen, First Nations choreographer, artistic director, writer, theatre maker, a cultural leader, and the creator uh, of the work Blood on the Dance Floor, which is our latest Red Door publication. Hi, Jacob. Good morning. Thanks for chatting to us. You're so welcome. So you first made this work uh, four or five years ago. Um, mm -hmm. Can you talk to us a little bit about how work begins for you, considering that this work has you know, movement and visual components as well as a sort of textual component? Uh, what, what sort of comes to you first? Hmm. So the first, uh, the, the first inspiration for this work, I was actually uh, attending Ilbidri's Black Writers Lab at the time. So the first kind of, write, the first scribblings um, of Blood on the Dance Floor came out of a, a task that was given to us by one of the Black Writers Lab facilitators, Peter Murray. And she had tasked us to come back to uh, 2012, to come into 2012, ready with something to, to put on the table and read out loud. And so I quickly scribbled this story about a friend of mine who had uh, been diagnosed with HIV. Uh, I was at Naysda Dance College, he was at Redfern. Um, he was an extraordinary dancer, beautiful. Um, but he was there, he was diagnosed with HIV. Um, the community's reaction and his family's reaction to that um, was not great and unfortunately not uncommon. So he ended up taking his own life. Uh, and so I wrote that story. That was the first story about uh, of Blood on the Dance Floor that came out as part of the Black Writers Lab. Mm. Um, and the thing that, the, the reason why that came out is because when Anthony passed away, people stopped saying his name and nobody referred to the fact that he was HIV positive. There was secrets and there was shame about it. And to me, I was like, I needed to honour, the one thing for me was that I wanted to honour his name, I wanted to honour his memory. And in doing so, when we started to build Blood on the Dance Floor, when I started to build a team around it, it was important to me that I had um, other Indigenous creatives around me that were key creatives that I could collaborate with so that we could build in Indigenous methodologies into the work. So yes, we, there was the um, acknowledgement and acceptance that we were making a black box theatre show. However, what we wanted, the challenge that we laid down for ourselves was because my, um, I suppose my foundations come from dance, my, my theatre foundations come from dance and more specifically ceremonial dance where you are working with songmen and songwomen and you're privy to those kind of methodologies and dramaturgies that the songmen and songwomen use. So that's what we wanted to bring into the making of Blood on the Dance Floor. It may not be evident in the finished product but that was the process that we used to get there. Yeah. Mm. And is that a process you've carried forward through through other works or does it have to be sort of remade each time you gather with uh, other artists? I think, um, no, it's a process that I know I do and I know some of my other colleagues um, do. We try, we continually try and build on that because it's, it's all kind of, uh, it's still new and evolving. The fact that we're taking those really old dramaturgies and methodologies and bringing them into contemporary practice, whereas previously we've just gone, here's an Aboriginal story and we'll do it in the Western style theatre. Whereas now I think the, the motive or the, the movement is to go, okay, so here's all these Western contexts and tools. Um, how can we use those to, uh, I don't know, how do they value add to what we already have? And how do we bring that to the fore? How do we bring Indigenous dramaturgies and performance making to the fore? And then, okay, so then how does all those Western tools how do they value add and if they don't goodbye yeah <laughs> i suppose i'm really interested in this work in, especially at, at australian plays because when we think about publishing it is often in that western tradition of literal uh, you know there is a text someone decides what the text is and who shall buy it and there's so many things around it that are kind of culturally 
um, Western. So for you putting this work into the world as a digital text, what are some of the things that you're excited about mm. or that are interesting to you about that process that sort of might give that work to a wider community or potentially even to other productions? Um, yeah, I'm kind of curious about that. Mm. Oh, number one, I'm really excited about that um, you've chosen to have that kind of content represented in that collection um, because it's important that those voices uh, are heard. I think um, when I talk about Blood on the Dance Floor as an autobiographical story, yes, but I kind of look at, yes, it is directly related to me and my family, but in a bigger sense, it's um, it's a voice for many people and hopefully one of, you know, only the first of many people or one in a string of many people. Um, so really to have those stories and to have those uh, voices in that collection is extremely exciting. Um, number two, it would be interesting to see how other people interpret that text. Because I've been told before, this is this is not a this is not a traditional like this. Does, this isn't a script, <laughs> um, uh, which is interesting. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how people interpret that. Mm. It, it is yeah. interesting. What what do you um, <laughs> what remnants of the rest of that process, which as you said, with your you know with the deep connection with your collaborators and. The, the movement and, and imagistic components of it. Um, how did you decide what went into the text, as it were? Were, were you interested in, you know, how, how do you as an artist decide how much you try and encapsulate everything that the performance might have been versus sort of sending a provocation out, as you said, for maybe many um, other voices to join? Mm. Well, interestingly, the process, um, the process of, because what is it? It's about 21 or so pages yeah, about, yeah. of actual text. So we started, I started with maybe, uh, it was either 48 or 56. I don't know why, that, I think it was 56 pages um, of text. Mm. So what ended up happening during that process? And we didn't rush from the time that script was at final draft, because I wrote in episodes. Much like um, I wrote, how we used, how I approached the text was much like how you pull together a song line or how you pull together um, a, a song cycle, which is, if you think of this one big story and it's many parts and many parts can, they don't necessarily um, happen in sequential order. Um, we used that much like bloody, uh, you know, Tarantino, how he uses, he cuts up film. It's really interesting that. Uh, but what we did though, is because the challenge was to treat the script and the work as ceremony, that there were parts of the story were sung, parts of the story are danced, parts of the story are represented as artwork that, you know, or traditionally would be paint on, um, your skin or, or, or on any kind of dance implement that you use to tell that story. That kind of art element ended up being um, with video artist Keith Deverell. So uh, we had a few different options in which to tell that story. So over the four years that we took to build that work, because um, we did, we started in 2012, we didn't uh, premiere until 2016. So we took four years um, to experiment and explore how best to tell it. And it was that thing of, do we really need to hear this or can it be, um, can it be best represented as physical movement? Mm -hmm. So there were, there were pages, reams and reams and reams of, of, of text that ended up becoming movement. Mm -hmm. There were reams of text that ended up becoming video art that were behind me. Yeah, yeah. so that was... Mm. That's fantastic, a sort of a, a distillation, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and, and it was really just questioning the best way, knowing here's, here's our bag of ceremonial tools, what's the best way 
which is the best avenue to take with this movement, visual art or song? Yeah, that's fantastic. Mm. And you've toured the show. I mean, obviously we're talking at the tail end of 2020 and when everything is kind of um, shut down, obviously still, but you've taken this work around. What has been the experience mm. of taking it to, what, what is it in different communities or contexts? Does the work shift for you? Does it tend to sort of stay the, the same? What's that experience been like? Um, it's interesting. Uh, I don't know. There's something about this work that has a certain intensity to it, I think. Even though I've tried to uh, keep a particular humour about it, because with that kind of content, there has to be humour. There has to be ways in for people that don't come from that reality or don't know very much about that reality. Let that be, you know, um, trawling beats for, for gay sex or, you know, whether it being um, not knowing who your, your grandmother is because you've been separated from by the government. Um, there are all these different realities in Blood on the Dance Floor that, uh, yeah, we had to, we had to come with humour. But however, there still remains a certain intensity and no matter where we go, audiences, there'll be some audiences that really get the humour because it's dark humour. It's that, oh, well, I am a bit twisted. So it's that humour that, um, you know, it's that kind of like, did you really say that? Am I allowed to laugh at that? Um, and a lot of audiences do. However, a, there are quite a few, cons we have quite a few conservative audiences in Australia who breathe in a lot. Um, but interestingly though, being that little soul performer up there in the lights when, you know, in a void, because I can't see anything, um, I can always feel an audience leaning in at me, which then becomes an extremely huge responsibility to, to hold them and to keep them safe, especially through some of those uh, darker passages in Blood on the Dance Floor. Mm. Um, oh, you know, performing in other countries, like performing in Car Canada was interesting. It was, um, yeah. Yeah, no, performing, performing in other countries, in performing in Canada was interesting. I thought that we would need to change a lot. Um, I thought we were up for uh, all kinds of misrepresentation and miscommunication. However, the story translated. Yeah, there's as very, um, a relatively similar experience with First Nations cultures and colonialism and mm. it's very not, not the same at all, but there is a, an interesting um, overlap with Canada and Australia, especially that, that, that's there. When, when you're making, a, you know, someone who, you know, is a HIV positive artist and someone who lived through a certain period of time that other generations now might be distanced from, how do you, how do you reconcile, I mean, in this show as well, holding memory and holding space for what happened and the people we lost, uh, what is that? Is there a tension there which you're trying to keep, mm. keep reminding people or is it something that we're happy to be separate from? Is that a strange experience? Yes, it is. And I'm glad you asked because we debated that. I debated that with um, the dramaturgs like uh, Chris Mead and Mari Lowry and the director, Isaac Drandich, all the creatives we debated. You know, all creatives were, were kind of treated equal in this one. Uh, it was quite a, it was a fascinating um, process. Mm -hmm. You know, when you've got a set designer um, becoming a choreographer, for example, like we all chipped in Crazy. and we're all crossing, you know, crossing each other's borders. Um, however, when we were, when I was writing this, there was the tension there to pay homage to what had come before. Um, but there was also on top of the fact that you know, there was Anthony's story. The other kicker that got me into um, really like investing my time into this was in 2013, when I actually really made up my mind, I'm gonna go for this. 
in 2013, we were celebrating a 30 year anniversary of the first HIV diagnosis in Australia. I was celebrating a 15 year anniversary of being HIV positive and I was gonna turn 40. So there were all these little confluences that all added up to this pressure point that went, Phew, tell it. But what I wanted to do in telling, um, into creating a work about HIV was that one of the things that I was sick of seeing in all forms of media, whether that be on the stage, whether that be in film or television, or even in, in editorials and books, was that everyone dies by the third act. And that's not my experience. For me and for many of us, HIV means that we stay on, um, we, keep our, we keep taking our meds, we maintain an undetectable viral load, therefore we can't pass on the virus, we live long um, and happy lives. Um, so I wanted to focus on that. However, in order to tell that story, there needed to be an acknowledgement of what had come before me. Because I didn't, I was only what, 10 in 1983 when the first uh, HIV diagnosis in Australia uh, was publicised. So I didn't, I don't have memories much like a generation or two before me of losing so many people, going to so many funerals. My dance teachers at NASDA used to talk about that, of going to five funerals a week. Um, and that's a very real experience that, you know, I heard mm. firsthand from those that survived. There are a couple of generations after me that have absolutely no clue of that. Um, so we did feel a sense of responsibility to tell that story, but I needed to tell it differently. Hence the drag queen at the start of the, the play. And that actually came from a real, uh, there are lines in there that started that monologue that come from a real conversation I had at the, uh, at the Beecham Hotel in Sydney. And it was a bunch of old queens, they'd just come and it was, oh, they'd just come from a matinee of, what's that one, the Peter Allen story? Oh, Boy From Oz? Boy From Oz, it had just started. And it was uh, Chrissy Hines and, well, not Hugh Jackman, the original. Oh, yeah. Um, and they just started it. And all these old queens were sitting on the end of the bar at the Beecham Hotel and they were all going on about Chrissy Hines being, you know, Oh, it was like Judy was in the room. And then they all started going on about, you know, Peter and dying of HIV and the, the dying of AIDS and the, the epidemic and what it was and da 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 da. And everyone started pitching in um, the, the sad stories about how sad it was and how, to, you know, how traumatic it was. And this one queen turned to me away from the group, turned to me and went, oh. God, you should have seen the drag queens. My God, they were all fighting over who could have the best funeral. I swear to God, it was sick. You know, and I just went, what an interesting bitch. Yeah. And I remember when I wrote it, when I started writing and I went, we need to acknowledge what came before. Mm. We've all heard the, we've all seen yeah, the almost you know, cliches of that story. Oh, we've seen Tom Hanks die. We've seen bloody, you know, we've seen all the stories where people are dying. It's all traumatic. And I just went, well, here's this other story about, oh, queens running around spying on each other's funerals to make sure that their funeral is going to be better. <laughs> do you feel, do you feel <laughs> that same tension as, a, and as an Indigenous artist about, you know, this incredible depth of culture and history and the this, this you know, incredible trauma that's happened. Do you feel the same tension about kind of holding space for that, acknowledging that, but also wanting to be able to, or, or currently being an artist that's telling the stories that are coming after those events? Um, not to say that those traumas aren't still around, but um, do, do you see that same thing as a, as a First Nations artist? Yes, and I think um, it is the same tension because those traumas are still very real. Um, as much as, you know, we look at the, the period that we've all just been through and are still going through with COVID and with this pandemic, there has been, you know, with the HIV positive community for many years, the experience of isolation uh, and stigma 
is still very, very real. And everybody around the world is now just experiencing that same thing. Um, but for people living with HIV who, are, who don't have support mechanisms around them, this has become an extremely traumatic time. And for the survivors, um, the ones that have been living with HIV longer than I have, and I've been living with it for 22 years now, but for the, the, the aunties and uncles that have been living with it from the early 80s, this has been an extremely triggering time for them. Mm. But the fact that in Aboriginal Australia, while you know, we have a government that, or governments that don't seem to understand how best to uh, make amends with our history or make amends with uh, First Peoples of this country, there is continued uh, uh, traumas being played. They, they aren't historical. Mm. They're, they're still being played out. When you've got kids up in detention in the NT, um, that have been beaten for no reason. When you've got kids being run over by truck drivers in Western Australia for su being suspected of stealing a bicycle. When you've got women dying in prisons in Victoria because uh, police officers won't tend to the cries coming from the cell, these aren't historical. These traumas <laughs> are very uh, present. Um, so while there's a tension there as a First Nations artist to want to speak about you know, our heroes and our new and, uh, you know, new narratives and da da da. There's historical um, traumas that uh, are still playing out in, uh, through intergenerational uh, trauma that's being passed on and carried. But there are also a lot of uh, current uh, traumas that keep triggering the same memories for the past 230 years. So, as First Nations artists, how we manage that tension by acknowledging and being and honouring and remembering and being, um, I suppose, respectful and authentic to all of that, but then also try and forge new pathways. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, mm. thank, you. thank you for that. I think you described this work at one stage as a kind of, as a love story or, or a story of hope. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did, is that still how you feel about it? And, and how do you feel about hope in general, given that we, we have been through this year about, about where we are? Yeah, no, it is still a love story in many ways. It's a love story to my dad who features uh, very strongly in this, in this uh, piece. It's a love story to Anthony to remember his name and his legacy. Um, and it is a love story because basically the premise is, you know, a guy is getting ready to go on a date and it's at that point in a relationship where everything's about to get serious where you go should we do should we become monogamous should we just see each other is this a real thing and it's at that point where you go oh fuck if this actually really happens then they're going to know every ugly thing about me it's that it's that's what the show's about really yeah. the hiv and the aboriginal this and the da da that um they're all kind of the you know, all the, the, the scaffolding, all the yeah. stuff around. Yeah. But the story, in essence, is a love story. It's about looking for love and about loving yourself and about um, being able to love someone else and give and take that very freely. Um, hope, yes, because it had... I wanted to make a hopeful story because things are changing in... Um, for people living with HIV. Not everything's a death sentence. Not everything is about stigma and discrimination, which it's still very present. But, you know, with, uh, with the changing of medications and all kinds of stuff where, you know, the U equals U campaign, scientifically, we, you know, if you maintain an undetectable viral load, you cannot transmit the virus. We have um, PrEP and PEP, new, medications where people can protect themselves, be proactive about, you know, who are HIV negative. You can play your part in protecting yourself about with HIV. It's not all our job. Mm -hmm. um, there are two people in that bed or three or four, if you're lucky. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I think hope not only for people living with HIV, but for the Aboriginal community and more broadly 
the bigger community, we have to have hope because there are so many evils that are winning. Mm. There are so many things that are winning at the moment that actually are holding the reins and holding strings and holding purse strings. Um, yeah, stories of hope, stories of that from the, the one voice that can become the many. I think we need to hear more of those because, yeah, there's too many things that are too many, too many bad things. That's shit. Yeah, I think I think lastly, you you know, you talk about the the power and influence of ceremony and ceremonial dance, and and, mm. and theatre being a, a ceremony at its heart, a ritual at its at its heart. Are there ceremonies that you've fallen back on this year? Are there little rituals for you that have become part of? life in lockdown and I, I know for many people conversations I've had about about being people returning to small rituals or remaking mm. or rediscovering rituals yeah 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 I am um, I hadn't thought about it much like that but uh walking mm. as a ritual has become a thing for me and that has gotten me through yeah um yeah same I walk yeah everywhere it was like a it was like a cure it was weird mm -hmm. you, you, mm -hmm. you walk to write don't you is that that's part of your process a, a sort of movement yeah. yeah yeah i need to move i need to move um i find it very hard to stay put and write i need um yeah i need physical stimulation mm. yeah it's quite artificial to sort of sit at a thing and force yourself to kind of you know <laughs> yeah i think it's tricky um is there anything else you you want to add I, i'm really i'm proud to publish this work and i think especially we talked earlier in the interview about works that don't immediately look like what we might conceive of as a kind of european idea of a play or even just a traditional idea of a play so it's really exciting to put things that are more open and provocative into the world um mm. you, you said you're making some works that kind of riff off this is there anything that you can tell us about them, or are there things that you're excited, like the kind of tangents that come that came out of Blood on the Dance Floor? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, for me, I think um, now is as a uh, as a writer, as a as an artist who's living with HIV and who's had the opportunity to have my voice out in the world, um, contemporary voices that are you know. Uh, that are both Aboriginal and HIV, have started a couple of new works. One of them being um, working with Michelle Tobin, who's one of two Aboriginal women in the country who are openly, um, who are open about their HIV status. Uh, Michelle is a bit of a legend. She's uh, been living with HIV for 30 years. She's a, uh, a mother and a grandmother of five, uh, beautiful grandchildren, she's an advocate, she HIV advocate, and she also um, is the Aboriginal officer at uh, POSLIFE New South Wales. So she does a lot, her life story is uh, extraordinary. So we've begun meeting because the next work will be telling her life story. Um, we're turning that into uh, a piece of theatre or it may be a theatrical concert at the moment. Yeah. Um, because music plays very heavily in her storytelling. When she tells me a yarn about a particular time, there's always a soundtrack that goes with it. Or there's a, you know, Prince is, you know, there's an association, there's an, a musical association. So I keep thinking, oh, okay, this is a collaboration with musicians, I think, yeah. um, because music is very influential. Yeah. The other one is an old script that I wrote, um, uh, when I was uh, doing my master's at BCA. And I've had that in the book, in the, in the drawer for about six years. And then last year, when I was touring Blood on the Dance Floor through Canada, I met a woman uh, over in Vancouver, uh, Val, who again is a grandmother uh, living with HIV, again, doing a lot of work trying to make space and carve out space and voices for other Aboriginal women living with HIV. And so I've looked at this old script and repositioned some of those characters so that Val, who I met 
in Vancouver is represented in this new work. Because for me, I suppose it's about putting the different voices. It's not just gay men living with HIV in Aboriginal community. In fact, we're the lowest demographic in Indigenous populations. The biggest, the highest demographic of uh, people living with HIV um, at the moment and their spike groups in Australia is Indigenous women and people who use uh, IV drugs, IV drug users. Mm. So those are the voices and or those are the, I think those are the voices that need to be given space. Yeah, yeah, Making, mm. uh, acknowledging that that is, is many people's story is, yeah, is really interesting. And I think also your work as a you know, community leader and arts leader is, is there's something really beautiful about what can I use my experiences and my um, skills and space to to enable what other stories can I can I enable as we kind of move move through your career I think it's really fascinating to do well thanks so much for talking to us Jacob it's been really beautiful um, we can't wait to publish this and um, I hope the rest of 2020 is um, uneventful and uh, and and that you stay safe and well yes yeah.